Are you all foot washing Baptist? <laughs> Has anybody ever actually asked you that question? Grew up in middle Georgia and there were some foot washing Baptists around. They were also known as primitive Baptists. They exercised washing each other's feet because just like we observe the Lord's Supper, that is a part of this Monday Thursday. We have been looking at the windows of our church, starting over here with the Annunciation of Jesus' birth and going through his life, and we have now come over to this side of our church, your left side, where we are looking at the last week of our Lord's life, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And now we have made it to that Last Supper, which is on the right side of the window, and on the left side, the same part of that night, washing the feet of the disciples. It's interesting, these foot-washing Baptists. Maybe you remember an allusion to them in Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird. You remember Scout, she goes and asks Miss Maudie if she were a foot-washing Baptist, and Miss Maudie says, child, my shell's not that hard. I'm just a regular Baptist. And then she asks a little bit more about that, and she says, well, some of those foot-washing Baptists came by last week and saw me out gardening and told me that I was a sinner. She said, in fact, they think that any pleasure is a sin, and they make the mistake of forgetting the greater call to love one another, which is also something our Lord Jesus gave us on that Monday, Thursday in the window that we examine today. We don't want to be that kind of Baptist, do we? We don't want to be those who are known simply for get condemning, but rather we want to know as Baptists who are filled with God's love and grace. In fact, I have never washed anyone's feet here at First Baptist Church of Statesville. You know, we have had some hand washings here, though. Dr. Jack Causey, our pastor emeritus, used to do that, where he would have a service where he would have a basin and we'd come forward and he would wash hands. And we've continued that tradition from time to time. And I must tell you that that is very impactful to me when we have done that. But we haven't done this foot washing very much. But if we're not foot washing Baptists, why would we have a whole window about Jesus washing the disciples' feet? Well, maybe we need to look at the scripture that's behind our window and ask the question, what is this foot washing really about? Well, one thing it is about is love. Did you hear that wonderful passage in the very first verse that Eddie read for us? It says, having loved them to the end. Other passages interpret that, other, I mean, other um, versions interpret that as he fully loved them, or he showed them the full extent of his love. In other words, when Jesus was preparing for his death and he gathered together those he loved to have this last meal with them, he wanted to show them how much he cared for them. And so he washed their feet, a job that was really for a servant. How much do we truly love one another? True love loves through the ups and downs of life. True love is there for one another. True love serves others. Jacqueline Zinn was a 55-year-old mother when she got the diagnosis that she had glioblastoma. She fought it hard and long, but she realized that her end was approaching. So what she decided to do was out of a great act of love, she took the last energy of her life and began to write letters to those she loved, particularly to her children, she wrote letter upon letter, letters to be opened at holidays or letters to be opened at graduations or weddings. Her son got his second letter. The first was one that he got shortly after death saying that 
she was so sorry that she could not be there for his life. But Jerry got a second letter when he graduated from UNC. In that letter, she talked about how proud she was of him. As he read that letter and wept, he said he remembered how many times he wanted to drop out of school. He was grieving his mother's loss. He wanted, though, to graduate because he knew that there was a letter waiting for him upon graduation. And he wanted to know what his mother was going to say. All of her letters she signed, I am watching over you. When our Lord Jesus Christ washed the disciples' feet, it was an act of love. A love that would go on beyond his life here on earth. A love that would remind them of who he was and what he called them to do. There's a second thing going on in the scripture that we see around this window this morning. It is about choices. Whether or not we will be faithful or whether we might betray our Lord. In the window we look at this morning, we only see three of the disciples. I'm not sure which ones they are, but I imagine that they are Peter, James, and John, for they are the prominent disciples in most of our pictures of the windows. Judas, I don't think, is in the window. However, he is in the story. In fact, there is a subplot going on underneath this story. While our Lord is preparing to give his life upon a cross, there's one of his own disciples preparing to betray him, to hand him over. Now, I don't like thinking about betrayal, not just because I don't like talking about Judas, but because I don't like thinking about my own betrayal of our Lord. During this season of Lent, we think through those choices that we make. Times when we are faithful and times when we make our own decisions to follow our own way. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Well, we don't truly know what was in his heart. But most scholars believe that Judas was trying to force Jesus' hand. Judas had come to follow Jesus because he wanted Jesus to be the kind of Messiah that he wanted Jesus to be. He wanted Rome to be overthrown. He wanted Jesus to come and be a different kind of king, and he wanted to be a part of that kingdom and be important in that kingdom. And he was hearing our Lord Jesus Christ say, I am going to die, I'm going to give my life, and Judas didn't want any part of that. And so he went, and for just a little bit of gold, he gave over Jesus. Maybe he thought that meant that Jesus would really rise up and revolt. We don't know. What we do know, however, is that Judas almost immediately regretted this betrayal. I don't know about you, but when I try to choose my own path instead of God's path, I always come to regret it down the road. For though I may think I know what is right for me, unless it is also in God's will, it does not turn out well. Valerie and I have been enjoying watching a show on Netflix called Heartland. It, it stars a woman named Amy who is a horse whisperer. But the character that I really like on that is the grandfather. His name is Jack. Recently, we were watching some episodes in which Jack got a major role. It was talking about how he had come back to the ranch for he grew up and he wanted to leave the ranch. He wanted to get off on his own, and he did, and he became a rodeo star. But when his sister died and his father could not manage the ranch alone, Jack came back. His grandchildren were talking to him about that and asking why he had given up his own dreams. And he said to them, once all I wanted to do was leave this place, and now all I want to do is be here. I love it. It's the right place for me. How many times in our life do we think this or that is what we might want or need? 
And God says, I have something better for you. Even Jesus himself prayed in a picture that we will see in a few weeks at the garden, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Judas was not looking for God's will, but his own will. Lent is a season in which we think about our faithfulness or our betrayal. And we need to consider this carefully. There's another thing going on in this passage and in this window as well, however. And that is the theme of serving and being served. Of course, this window is about Jesus setting the example of serving, of being a servant, of doing that lowliest job of washing feet. But there's also a little dialogue that goes on between he and Peter. When he gets to Peter, Peter says, No, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says to Peter, Unless I wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me. Don't you love how Peter is usually on one side and then he slings over to the other? (laughs) When he says, you can't wash my feet, and Jesus says, you can't have anything to do with me, he says, oh, then wash my whole body, my hands, everything, my head. (laughs) And Jesus says, you're already clean. You only need your feet washed. I think what Jesus was saying there was, Peter there are some things that you need to tend to on your own. That we all need to take personal responsibility. And you've already had a bath today, but you've been out trudging around and your feet now are dirty and I'm going to do this as an act of service. We don't want always for folks to do stuff for us. Sometimes it feels degrading to have someone to humble themselves before us When you look at this window, look at Peter who's having his feet washed. He finally gets there. His hand is over his heart and he's looking down at our Lord in love. It's as if he finally understands that if you're going to be a part of Christ, you have to learn a couple things. One is you have to learn to receive God's grace humbly and the other is once you get that grace you have to give that grace in service there's a little boy named Matthew Flores who lives in Sandy Utah he's only 12 years old he one day met the post worker out by his mailbox the post worker's name is Ron Lynch he asked Ron do you have any extra junk mail can you imagine <laughs> Why in the world would anybody ask for any extra junk mail? And little Matthew explained when Ron asked, why would you want extra junk mail? He says, I love to read. And we don't have any books. I just want anything to read. Well, postal worker Ron immediately went home and got some books to bring back. Then he put on Facebook about this boy who wanted some books And pretty soon books begin to flow in from all over that community and even around the world. And do you know what Matthew did with those books? He read them. But then he began to give them to his friends who also didn't have enough books. I think we see in Matthew's story that example of both accepting grace and giving grace That is what this whole window is about, being a servant to the one who has served us. So how do we become a servant? Well, to become a servant, we must remove anything that hinders us from service. In this picture, we hear and see that Jesus first takes off his coat. That cloak that they would wear around in traveling that which he would not want to get wet and dirty, he takes it off and takes on the appearance of a servant. For they did not wear these coats. And he then begins to wash the disciples' feet. What is it that we would have to remove if we were truly to be servants? 
Well, I think one of the things we'd have to get straight and remove would be some attitudes that we might have. One attitude might be, well, you know, I don't want to serve others because they don't really deserve it. They need to learn to fend for themselves. And you know what? They don't necessarily deserve our help. Nor do we deserve the salvation that God has given to us. It is not about deserving. It is not our place to judge. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, if someone asks for a shirt, give them your coat as well. Jesus on that same sermon says, someone asks you to walk a mile and carry the pack, walk two miles. Go the extra mile we talk about. We don't know about these folks' lives. We only know that they need help. When I was living in Atlanta, Georgia, and was a young pastor, a fellow showed up on our doorstep one day because we lived right by the church and everybody knew that that's where the pastor lived. And we'd often get folks coming needing help. And he asked if we might have some food. But then he asked something different. He said, could I work for it if you have it? What might you need done around your house? Now, I knew it might be a scam, but I decided to take a chance. He began to rake leaves for us. I went out and took him out some lemonade and found out his name was Jeremy. And that he lived under a bridge not too far away from our house. Jeremy came back and worked several times for our family. We began to invite him in to eat lunch with us when he would be there. And about the second time he was there, Jeremy said, Pastor, would you let me have the blessing? And I said, of course, Jeremy, you can pray. Jeremy began to pray, thankful for the food, thankful for our family. And then he said, Lord, I thank you that I was not shot today. I wasn't sure what to make of it. I didn't know if he was trying just simply to shock us. So after he said amen, I said, Jeremy, what was that bit in your prayer about not being shot today? He said, well, last night under the bridge where I live, there was a shooting and my friend was shot. And I was not. And I am grateful for that today. I began to wonder and imagine what might his life really be like? This person that was becoming a friend to me. Oh, we need to be smart in the way we help others. Yes, we don't just hand out money here. We try to find ways where we give people food or clothes or those things that they might need. And we do need to be good stewards of what God has given us. But we don't need to have this attitude of that we are better than others. Maybe another thing we need to take off is that attitude of, I don't have anything to give. I don't have any resources. We all have something. We all can do something. When I was in college, I went one summer to be a summer missionary right outside of Washington, D.C., in, in the Maryland and Virginia suburbs. And each week, I'd go to a different church. And, and there I'd work doing whatever they needed at that church, helping vacation Bible schools or other things. But one of the interesting things was each week I was in a different home. There would be a host. There were some really nice homes I stayed in. But one week I went and it was a very, very modest home. I went in and they had about five kids in a very, very small home. I looked around and I could tell that they didn't have a whole lot of worldly goods. And yet when I went in that home... They immediately had a home-cooked meal for me and my partner that year. They immediately showed us the bedrooms that we would have. And I said, where were the kids sleeping? And they said, don't worry about that. We'll pile them all in our room. And then they said, could we wash your clothes? No one else that whole summer had ever done that for us. They showed us their laundry room, but... No one has said, hey, could we do this for you? And I began to think, this family, with the least of all the families that we experienced that summer, gave and did the most 
to make us feel at home. It's not about how much you have. It's about what you do with, you have, with what you have. What else do we need to take off or get rid of if we're truly to be servants of the servant? Well, we need to remove those barriers between us and them. Jesus did not do ministry from above. But in this stained glass window, we see he did ministry on a knee. Bowing down to wash feet. There's a lot of us and them in our world today. And as long as it's that way, we will never see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I have a friend, his name's Timothy Peoples. Timothy's an African-American. He's also a pastor. He's pastor of Emerywood Baptist Church in High Point, and that congregation is a white congregation. When Timothy accepted that call, his family didn't really understand and asked him a little bit about why he would go and pastor a predominantly white church. Folks in the church weren't quite sure of that calling. Why were they calling a black pastor for a church that was mostly white? It wasn't anything to do about Timothy's skills. He is highly educated and a wonderful, good pastor. But what I was really interested in was not those other folks, but why Timothy chose to do this. He answered my question this way. He said, Nelson, if you want to break down barriers, you've got to get into each other's space. You've got to begin to make contact. You've got to get face to face with one another. You have to learn how to deal with each other. And so this is where I am. This is where God has placed me. What about us? There are plenty of barriers out there in the world today, social economic barriers, racial barriers. Jesus took off that which restricted him from serving and bowed down just as Philippians tells us that he took on the form of a human, leaving the glory of heaven to serve us. But not only did he take something off, he picked something up. He picked up a towel. The best sermons I've ever experienced were not ever preached, but were taught. They were taught by example. They were observed. The best thing our church, First Baptist, can do is not just to have people come and hear me preach, though I appreciate it when you do. It would be for us to continue to be the church that we have call, been called to be, the church we have been through, the history of this church. It has put missions first and foremost and has put service at the front and heart of our congregation. I read a story in Reader's Digest recently. It was back in Georgia where I'm from, in Gordon State College in Barnesville, Georgia. I know the place. The campus police were called because there was a young man who had set up a tent on campus and was living in the tent. The other folks around were not impressed. The homeless folks were starting to set up camp right there on the campus, and so they called the police. The police officer got there, and he found a 19-year-old named Fred Barley. But Fred wasn't just homeless. Fred was actually a student there at Gordon State College. Fred had rode his bicycle. It's actually his little brother's bicycle that he had borrowed. One that was way too small for him. Had rode it six hours to get to the campus. He had come several days early because he thought he could get a job and get enough money to find an apartment, but he didn't, so he was living in a tent. Officer Richard Carricker was faced with the choice of what he would do with this young man. Carricker's heart went out to him, so he took him to a hotel and paid for it for the night. Then he began to talk around to other officers about this young man and to other folks in the community they began to collect clothing and school supplies. They got him a job at a local pizzeria, and soon money began to flow in even for his educational expenses. 
they saw someone that needed help and they simply acted. But there's something else in this window. Remember I said that Jesus loved them till the end? Jesus got involved and stayed involved. Long-term help that really makes a difference takes time. Next Sunday, we are going to take up an offering in memory of Eddie Steele. Now, when I say the name Eddie Steele, there are some of you sitting here this morning that will have fond memories, and you knew Eddie, and you know his story. There are others who are newer to our church that have no idea who Eddie Steele is, and some of you have come and asked me, who is this Eddie Steele that we're taking up an offering in his honor to give to Fifth Street Ministries to the homeless shelter? Eddie Steele was a homeless man here in our community of Statesville. He used to walk up and down the I-77 corridor. Folks would see him behind fast food places, literally finding food out of the garbage. He used to sleep underneath a fallen building out at Boy Scout 609 off of Broad Street. There he was trying to live his life. He was afraid of people. He stayed away from folks. Peyton Morrison and Katie Welburn saw him and decided they would like to do something. So they began to leave food out near where he lived. He wouldn't get anywhere near them. But they would take food and leave it. They would take clothing and leave it. I talked to Katie just the other day and she reminded me that it took a long, long time before Eddie would get anywhere near them. But finally, after months and even years, he began to trust them a little bit. He began to talk to them about his situation. He would get in the car with them and let them give him rides. The first time he ever came here to First Baptist Church, Katie sat with him way back in the back. They brought in some folding chairs because Eddie was so scared they thought he might bolt and they thought if we sit way in the back and he knows he can get up and go, maybe he will experience church. He stood there and his legs shook. Katie calmed him, but he stayed and he felt the grace of this church. Katie said that Eddie soon became like another son to her. Her children, Clint and Houston, used to play basketball with them. Katie said to me this past week, if you really want to help somebody, you've got to be willing to get near them, to get close to them. Our church began to minister in other ways along with First Presbyterian Church. A local dentist in town knew that Eddie was so scared of people that he met him after hours to do dental work. A local doctor in town began to help him get on the right medications that he needed. Our church opened up our old scout room, which is down below the Family Life Center, and he used that as an apartment until we helped rent an apartment for him. Some of the men of the church knew that he was getting to where he couldn't ride his bicycle very well, so they got together and bought him a moped. Buzz and Jackie Holzhauser began to take him out to Mitchell Community College where he was working on a GED. But we didn't just change Eddie's life, did we? Eddie changed our life and the life of this church. That's why we remember him. When I showed up here, Eddie wasn't a homeless person. Eddie was a volunteer in our church. He was one of our assistant custodians. I remember the very first time someone told me Eddie's story, I was just amazed. For all I knew was Eddie was this loving, caring person that was a part of our congregation. You remember he used to set up chairs in the fellowship hall and they were so precise. (laughs) Each row had to be just, just right. He would volunteer back when we had our um, food pantry here. Eddie knew the homeless people of the community. Sometimes he would come in 
and he would see a family he knew and he'd come in and he'd tell the workers we need a little bit more food for that family and we never questioned because we knew he knew the need David McDaniel who used to work in our food pantry here told me that if you needed anything at all done at First Baptist Church all you had to do was ask Eddie and he was on it that is a beautiful story of First Baptist Church in our ministry. But I wonder, how could that story be repeated? How could that story be expanded upon? Yes, we're going to take up an offering and give to Fifth Street Ministries, and that is a wonderful thing for us to do. But I wonder if there's a way for our congregation to really combat poverty to really be the servant to the servant. To find ways to not just help, like we did with Eddie, to help multiple people. To teach them ways of coming back to life. To teach them ways of living more healthfully in all those different areas, whether financially or medically or spiritually. I think we can. You remember I started out this morning by asking, are we foot-washing Baptists? Well, no. We don't have an observance where we come down and wash each other's feet, although I have been a part of some of those services, mainly on retreats, and they can be beautiful times. But I think Jesus was talking about something more than just some ceremony. When I ask the question, are we foot washing Baptists? I'm really asking the question is, do we remember that foot washing is more than just something that happened a long, long time ago with Jesus and disciples? What was Jesus trying to do? He was trying to show them his love and grace and show them what he wanted them to be like as well. When Peter objected, he said, unless you can become a servant, you can have no part of me. He said, you call me teacher, and I am, and that's true. But you cannot be greater than your teacher. Are we foot-washing Baptists? I pray that we are in the ways of service in the world that will make a true difference today. We come now to a time of commitment. During the season of Lent, we open the doors to our church to those that might want to come and join with us to those that might want to confess Christ as their Lord and Savior. Perhaps this is a time when you think of your own call to service and ask God, what ways could I emulate Christ, the foot washer? Would you make whatever commitments that God leads you to make this morning?